Welcome to everybody. Um, thanks for coming to this Stanford Health Library event. We're going to be talking um, about, uh, about lung cancer. It's still, unfortunately, the number one uh, cancer killer in both men and women, although that curve has started to come down a little bit um, in the last few years. Um, it, it does occur mostly in people who have had a history of cigarette addiction, but we also are seeing a fair amount, especially in this area where we have a big Asian population, um, a fair amount of non-smokers. Now about 10 or 15 percent of lung cancer occurs in non-smokers as well. Um, it gets a lot less press and certainly less research dollars than, than some other you know, equally terrible cancers. Um, for example, breast cancer, which has just more vocal advocacy groups, unfortunately. Um, but hopefully that's something that we can change and create some um, awareness of lung cancer. This is Lung Cancer Awareness Month uh, actually going on right now. Fortunately, there have been a lot of new developments in the management of lung cancer that are beginning to make a dent, uh, we think and hope, on the, on the high mortality rates. Stanford um, is right on the cutting edge of all these things. Um, and uh, what we'll do is talk about a few of those advances tonight. We'll focus on screening for lung cancer, trying to find um, early stage lung cancers, which has just been shown to improve mortality and I think hopefully will be paid for by insurers and Medicare soon. Um, and then we'll talk uh, Dai Upadye from our Department of um, Pulmonary Medicine. Uh, we'll talk about the screening, the background on screening and screening itself. I'll talk about how do you manage these little small tumors that we often find with screening, which is somewhat different than what we're used to with lung cancer. Um, Bill Liu from our Radiation Oncology Department will talk about uh, stereotactic radiation, which you've probably heard called lots of different things, saber or SBRT uh, or cyber knife for small tumors. And uh, Dr. Heather Wakeley, uh, who is our head thoracic oncologist, medical oncologist, will talk about the newer molecular treatments and what we call targeted treatments for lung cancer. So we think we've got uh, a good program. We'll take questions, uh, a couple of questions after each segment, um, and then we'll have some time at the end also if something else pops into your mind. And uh, let's, let's get it started. So Daya Upadye will start from uh, medicine. Thank you, Joe. So um, today's talk is uh, based on lung cancer screening and early diagnosis and management of lung cancer. So if you know that lung cancer kills more people than breast cancer, colon cancer, and cervical cancer combined, all three combined. And nearly 90% of these cancers are related to smoking, okay? There are about 226,000 people were newly diagnosed each year, and 160,000 people die each year. That's an enormous number. And on an average, five-year survival is less than 15%. The reason I'm giving you a little bit of background, it will tell you why we are so aggressive about developing new strategy to diagnose these cancers early, as well as manage uh, the treatment of lung, or do management of lung cancer. So if you look at this graph, this graph shows uh, different types of cancers here. Let me get this working. Yeah, I got it. Um, so you can see these are, these are different types of cancers, stomach, uterus, colon. The only graph which is going still up is their lung cancer. And that's the reason we need to do a lot to get this graph down. And if you look at the mortality, this is the cancer deaths. You see this is colon, breast, and prostate. Even if you don't read the numbers, certainly this is three times higher than any other cancers. So significantly uh, important for us. And if you look at the risk factors, of course, 90% of um, patients do have risk factors of smoking. And it can be whether you smoke as a primary smoking or it can be secondhand smoke. And that can be anywhere in a public place as well as maternal, as well as you know, in a car. Um, certainly, the secondhand smoke, uh, secondhand smoke is significantly a risk factor for this. If you look at what happens to the smoker's lung, this is a healthy lung, which is a nice and pink lung. Look what happens to the smoker's lung. There's a charring, there's a lot of scarring, there's a nicotine deposition, there's a coal deposition, and that's what damages, causes DNA damage and epithelial cell damage to the lung. That's what causes decrease in oxygen. Patients require oxygen, they develop emphysema, and another thing what they develop is lung cancer. Now, if you look at the um, cigarette smoke, what do they have? 
oh my God, there are plenty of things here. And most of them are, them are toxic agents. Some of them you can recognize, methane, this, this is arsenic, this is uh, nitrogen oxide, cyanide. All of these are toxic agents. Plenty of these toxic agents, they combine and they cause all the effect in the lung. Now if we look at the risk factors, what are other risk factors? Other risk factors known are air pollution, radon or uranium exposure, previous radiation, say, you know, chemotherapy or other, uh, sorry, earlier cancer or cancer-related radiation or cancer-non-related radiation wherein occupation exposure can give rise to. Other things like previous lung diseases such as COPD, lung fibrosis, or toxic chemicals. Heavy smoking, 30 to 40 years of heavy smoking increases the risk by 20 times. Also, addition of two or three agents together increases the risk significantly. And this is you can look at um, patients with asbestos. This is a patient with no risk factors. If you have asbestos as a risk factor, this increases the risk six times. If you have smokers combined, or just the smokers, they have 11 times risk factors. But if you combine these together, the risk increases to 60% nearly. That means combination of two or more factors is certainly a deadly thing. What about other smoke? You know, people are always ask me in my, um, as a pulmonologist, we get these questions quite frequently. What about electronic smoking or electronic cigarette? They contain nicotine. Nicotine is also known carcinogen and an addictive agent, and that can cause cigarette craving. Certainly, this in adds, to this, uh, adds to the risk factor. I do get told by, pay, by people that I smoke cigars but don't inhale. What does it mean? Of course, you know, if you enjoy the smoke, that means nicotine is reaching your brain. And nicotine can only reach your brain if the smoke goes in deep into the lung, it gets absorbed, and nicotine goes through the blood to your brain. That means you can think that nicotine, uh, the inhaled, inhaled smoke is not reaching your lung, but it is, and it is going, it's causing damage, as well as increasing nicotine content. And that's the reason it is bad. What about smokeless tobacco, chewy tobacco? They are equally harmful. Now, smoking and gender, there is certainly a difference in women who smoke and men who smoke. Tobacco control has decreased, uh, smoke, decreased cancer in men, but increased in women. There are several reasons why it did happen. Lung cancer prevalence has increased in women by 150% from 74 to 94. Since, since the smoking, anti-smoking regulation came, instead of decrease in smoking, uh, decrease in smoking-induced cancer, women's, cancer in women is still going up. Also, death rate, is, death rate has gone up by 600%, and I'll tell you the reason why. Women are one and a half times more at risk than men with equal amount of smoking. If you take age adjusted and the same brand of the cigarettes, the women are highly likely or one and a half times more at risk of developing cancer than men. And that's why, if you look, the prevalence of women is going up, while men is still going down. This is the reason. It's because of the smoking revolution in women. You know, since the advertisement of 1960, it was advertised that earlier, before 1960, women used to do this. And now they are modernized. So Virginia Slim is for you. So the advertisement is directed towards modernizing women. So as a result, what happened? Smoking in women went up, and that's a result of, as a result of that, so certainly the risk of cancer went up. Also, the advertise, advertisement also uh, actually had a brand thing, you know? They said, you have, we have come a long way, baby, from this side to this side. So that's what made um, increase in um, addiction as well as smoking. So lung cancer is preventable. Since the risk factor is known, we know that it's secondary to smoking. If we can stop smoking or if we can prevent smoking, certainly it is preventable. Like most of the, uh, most of the other cancers, one thing in lung cancer we know that we can, if we can stop smoking, certainly we can limit it. Early diagnosis is, on, is the only factor that can improve survival. So the role of the pulmonologist or lung specialist comes way before the lung cancer is diagnosed, okay? The most important work must start before the diagnosis. It's, it's our job to identify these high-risk patients early, do the screening, and follow up these patients with screening for a long time until the time they are in the risk category. Also, if we find the lung nodules, lung nodules are the earliest tiny lesions which are seen on the, on the CAT scan. And these lesions go form later on a mass or a cancer. So these are the 90% of these are non-cancerous. But our job is to find out 
what are the 10% which are cancerous, diagnose them early, and send, send them to our oncologist colleague. Now, early diagnosis is why it's important, because it is the only factor that improves survival, so far shown, okay? So there is something called a survival time clock. This is, you know, I imagine this is a time clicking. Since the time we see the CAT scan showing abnormality, we need to uh, work fast. Now, this is a reason, because the staging or survival, they vary. If you diagnose the cancer at early stage, survival is better. If you diagnose the cancer at stage 1A, survival is 75%. So if you wait for this stage to go down to 3A, what happens? 1A to 3A, there is a drop of 60% survival. So that means you know, you're waiting for two months or three months for a CAT scan or waiting to see what happens. Is it decreasing the survival of that patient? Okay. Similarly, 1A to 1B, from here to here, this is a short interval. There's a decrease person, 20%. If I'm the person who, we, who somebody is waiting on, I don't want this 20% to drop, right? All of us want to improve the survival. So this is why it is important to diagnose it early, get it work immediately, diagnose it immediately, and uh, get, get to the patient to the treatment or surgery. And our goal is to identify these patients as stage 1A or 1B so that we can at least decrease survival by 60% if we are effective. And that is the reason you know, early diagnosis uh, trials have been done. This is a trial for early diagnosis of lung cancer, which was published in New England Journal of Medicine. It came out in August 4, 2011. That is about um, 12 or 13 months earlier. And that is the first trial have shown uh, that there is a reduced reduction in lung cancer mortality using low dose CAT scan screening. The patients they were screened were current or former smokers. They were between 55 and 75, 74 years of age. They had history of smoking at least 30 pack years. That means two pack per day for 15 years. And former smokers, they, they had quit less than 15 years, uh, um, less than 15 years. Then the national, this is the, this is the, this is the title. They called it a national lung cancer screening trial. The trial went on between this date and this date. There were 33 U.S. centers participated. There were 53,000 uh, patients screened. And the low-dose screening versus CT was done in half and half, 26,000 versus 26,000. More than 90% 90, 90 patients stick to the screening. And the rate, for, rate of positive for screening in CT screening was 24% while the X-ray was 6.9%. The incidence of cancer was this number, and X-ray was this number, okay? The death rate was 345 in 100,000, while in X-ray chest was this. So a relative reduction of 20% mortality was calculated. That means if you look at the difference between the X-ray chest and low-dose CD, 20% was saved, okay? And the reduced death rate was all-cause mortality was 6%. So there were several other reasons, you know, infections were found or other things, treatable causes were found, and those were in 6.9%. Uh, nevertheless, there were false positives several patients. And I'm going to tell you about the false positive numbers ahead. So cumulatively, the graph showed that there is, using low-dose CT, there was an increased diagnosis as well as decreased death. Of course, this is good for us because so far we have not been able to achieve these two things. So what is the false positive? Now, false positive amount, that means the X-ray or CT shows abnormality, but these are not certainly cancers. Now, we found that false positive occurred in 92% of the cases. Now, I've just put forth the tables to show you and understand if we have 90% of false positive tests, why are we doing screening, right? So this is the number. In lung cancer, there are 226 patients diagnosed each year. In breast cancer, somewhat little, uh, higher than that. While in colon cancer, 140,000. The age adjusted ratio is this, this, this. But those are not important numbers. What I'm talking about, five-year survival. Five-year survival in lung cancer is 15%. In breast cancer is 89% because we do mammogram and effectively and 64 in colon cancer because we are doing effective colon cancer screening. But if we do, despite of achieving, having false positive 92%, if we are able to achieve eight diagnoses in 8% and save 20% mortality, what does 20% mortality mean? That means 
20% out of this we are able to save. That means you are saving those many people's lives each year. And if you look at this, this, part, this particular number, it's as much as you save in breast cancer. So it's an enormous number, although it is 90% false positive is an enormous number, and that's why it is important, despite false positive, okay? So the National uh, Lung Cancer, um, uh, National Comprehensive Cancer Network put forth guideline who should do screening, and they recommend that it should be done only with the facility which has low-dose CT screening protocols, and it should be multidisciplinary team approach like us, like we have team four or five people, five specialities teaming up together to do these, these uh, programs. Hospitals and screening centers should be established, and they should follow ethical policies to conduct this particular, uh, particular program, and do not offer any extra chest as an option for CT screening. And this is important because we see often that X-ray chest is replaced for CT screening, and that's not an ideal way to go. So at Stanford uh, University, we do low-dose CT screening, for lung, lung cancer, we use national lung cancer screening uh, trial protocol as well as NCCN guidelines, and I'm gonna give you a word on that. Currently, CT screening is not covered by insurance, but we are working on that. Primary MD can assess eligibility, and smoking cessation is encouraged or must. Can you have a question? Oh, yes. It's pressing my tongue, because my husband passed a few months ago. He never smoked. He was among the 15% who get lung cancer without smoking. Yes. And I wonder whether you can address that because we got the diagnosis stage four. There was absolutely nothing before. He looked healthy. Thank you for taking my question. Absolutely. So uh, what, we, what we do is every time we see abnormality or patients when they are non-smoker, when they're patient, present with symptoms, we do uh, test them. None. None. That's unfortunate, yeah. Yeah. Um, let me go quickly. Yeah. It's a conservative yeah. screening. I mean, you know, right now, screening is open for patients who meet the criteria who were proven in this study to benefit from that. <clears throat> the problem is if you just start screening everyone, then the false positive rate might be 99%. And then you're going to have people subjected to stress, anxiety, maybe an unnecessary procedure. So you can't screen everyone. But we know around here, particularly with um, uh, near, uh, Far Eastern Asian background population, we see a lot of cancer in non-smokers. Um, and I wonder if at some point, you know, once it's studied further, there will be a certain population, you know, like that, that's screenable, but we don't have that data right Thank now. Thank you. So. Thank you. Okay, so, um, where was I? Okay. So um, the, the second, second risk factors, you know, if you have risk factor for radiation exposure, uh, sorry, um, low dose screening, so we need to optimize the radiation exposure because all of the routine CAT scan which are done, they have significant high amount of radiation exposure. And if we go on screening everybody with high dose radiation, then that itself increases the risk factor for, that, or that itself is a risk factor for development of cancer. So we wanted to optimize the radiation exposure. And so radiation exposure is optimized to 1.5 millisievert, and that's equivalent to one mammogram or three chest x-rays. It's also equivalent to six months of you know, beach, uh, uh, beach sun exposure, and there is no intravenous contrast medium given. That means kidneys are protected, okay? And we do not screen patients who have either infections or they have symptoms, okay? So if somebody presents because they have abnormality, if they have prior CT or they have unexplained weight loss because they have some primary problems. And we use, at Stanford, we use NLST criteria, which I already mentioned to you, that these are 355 to 75, 74 years of age, but we added the modified criteria, which are NCCN guidelines, and that shows that anybody who's 50 years of age, anybody who is 20 pack year or more smoking, and any additional one risk factor, such, such as occupational exposure, cancer history, or family history of cancer, or any other disease, such as COPD or lung fibrosis, okay? We do run lung nodule program because every patient who comes in, before they are diagnosed, they need to be monitored and detected. Their diagnostic investigation should be done before they are diagnosed. So all of these patients need to be monitored meticulously over a period of time. And all patients do get monitored at least 
minimum of two years when they, they, when they have larger nodules or every yearly when they have risk factors. So we identify their symptoms, we give them differential diagnosis if they are infection, we treat their infection or cancers, we treat them and send it to our colleague. Or and then we decide a plan to follow up or perform the diagnostic biopsies. And then once that is done, we categorize them into different category. If they have negative screening, then we do rescreening re every year, annual screening. If they have intermediate risk factor and intermediate signs, then we watch them. And watching is depending on the size of the nodule, medium-sized nodule, they will, they will be often frequently uh, screened every three to six months. Or we, uh, they, if they have smaller, tiniest nodules, then the, then the screening will be every annually. If they have suspicious lesions, which are which require diagnostic, or if they have been diagnosed can as cancer, then we send it to the treatment team, which are surgeon or radiation or medical uh, oncologist. Now here's one, two small slides I'm gonna show you why we shouldn't do x-rays, and we get, I get this very often. You can see this particular woman had a cancer. This x-ray chest relatively didn't show anything. There was an abnormality which was behind this particular area, which was not noticed. And you can imagine when we did the CAT scan look, this is a big mass which was, which was not seen apparently on the x-ray. Similarly, this woman also smoked quite a bit. There was abnormality in the, in the x-ray which was not seen. Again, the CAT scan showed and this turned out to be cancer. Certainly, so we need to monitor these patients meticulously. We need to identify them early and we need to diagnose them as quickly as possible so the treatment can be offered. And that is the reason why we need to be aggressively working on lung cancer screening. Having said that, you know, once we diagnose the patient, we send it to surgeons and our colleagues. So, uh, so the question is, is there any screening for uh, young people younger than 55? So far, the guidelines are um, put forth are 55 and above, uh, or 50 and above. Um, we have not looked into if we can do a screening in patients less than 50 years of age. However, any, per, any person or any people, anybody who has significant amount of smoking or smoking-induced lung damage, they must be screened. Uh, and we as a pulmonologist, we watch them very carefully. Screen clinically. You know, clinically, not as a lotus. Yeah. They should get a CAT scan screen is right now there's no evidence that they should. Um, you know, the screening criteria are very controversial. You have all sorts of groups trying to angle, saying more people should be screened, less people should be screened. It's a very controversial topic. So basically, right now at Stanford anyway, we're staying with what's been proven to be useful. Because there is a downside to screening. You can find things that are nothing, that look just like cancers, that could lead to stress and sometimes, you know, in the wrong hands, an unnecessary procedure. Wouldn't you take a, a biopsy if you were suspecting something pathological? I'll talk about that a little bit right now. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Di. So I'm a, I'm a thoracic surgeon. And um, what I'm going to do is focus on how do you diagnose these nodules that are found during screening? How do you figure out what they are? And how do you deal with them when you, when you figure out that one of them is a cancer or maybe a cancer? And what's the best surgery for that? And then um, what's the best surgical approach? We now have minimally invasive approaches to do things for smaller nodules. So I'll, I'll touch base on some of that. So this is the kind of thing we used to see. We still see it once in a while, but uh, more often as there are more CT scans done, either for some other purpose or for screening, we don't see these big, huge tumors very often anymore. What we tend to see now, these are a bunch of CAT scans. That little splotch, this is all normal lung. These are the ribs. The heart's over here. That little splotch or something like this, a little splotch of, of uh, density down here, or that's a, a, that turned out to be a cancer right there. Mm, there, so you can't, it doesn't project very well. But there's a little early stage cancer right there. And we see a lot of these now, and these are the things that are gonna get picked up more and more with CT screening. And then the question is, well, what do you do about that? Is that really something that's gonna kill someone? Um, this one back here. So we find a lot of these, as, as Daya was telling you, there are a lot of false positives, false positive meaning there's something on the scan, but it turns out not to be cancer when you follow it for a while and you see it doesn't change or you do a procedure. 
Um, only a small subset represent cancer. So we're definitely going to be doing people a disservice if we just start taking out all of these little things that turn up in screening. So how can you figure out if something is cancer, if one of these little things is cancer? Well, we have bronchoscopy. Uh, uh, I don't see it very well from here, but the tube goes down your throat and down the airways, and you try to put a needle or take samples from it. But it's hard to access these small peripheral nodules that way that are way out in the lung. And even if you can access it, you may think you got into it, get a, quote, negative, but it may actually be a cancer. You can't, with a small needle, be sure you're getting the right stuff. Or you, we can do a needle biopsy through the chest wall, through the ribs. We call it a transthoracic needle biopsy. Same problem. You can't get at a lot of these small ones. It's too hard to put a needle in it. And there's sampling error. So the only sure answer is to remove one of these things by surgery. But obviously, surgery is surgery. It hurts, and it's inconvenient, and there's a slight risk um, you know, of something worse happening, and it's costly to the healthcare system. Um, so you have to, you know, you have, there's a balance. When do we actually do surgery for these and when don't we? Probably a lot of you have heard of PET scans. So PET scans are supposed to tell us what's cancer and what isn't, right? But not that simple. So this happens to be a little one and a half centimeter thing that lit up brightly on a PET scan and it is cancer. And in things that are greater than a centimeter, PET scan's not bad. It's about 94% sensitive, meaning if you have a cancer, it'll be positive on the PET scan. And it's less good, specific, meaning uh, specificity, meaning will it show up other things sometimes and say they're cancer, but they're, but they're really not. So it does do that about 17% of the time. And all of these things are worse. In California, the specificity numbers are even worse because we have a fungal disease called coccidiomycosis around here that often looks like cancer. And and we have a lot of non-smokers who get uh, cancers that, are, that look like what we call ground glass on a CAT scan, and those do not light up on PET scan, but they are very early cancers, essentially. So PET scan's not that great. So sometimes we are forced, if, usually there are strict criteria if we get a, a, quote, positive screen. If we get something that's five millimeters in size, you don't go to a surgeon. You get another screen in six months. Okay, so only if something has grown or it's over a centimeter, et cetera, will you even see a surgeon for a consideration of this. So in the old days, 10 years ago, just to take out a small nodule, we'd make, have to make an incision from here to here and spread your ribs, and I'll show you more of that later just to have it out. But now we can do VATS, video-assisted thoracic surgery, where we can make small incisions and go in, and I'll show it to you, and with very little discomfort, or less anyway, I should say, um, you can have it out. So here's an old-fashioned thoracotomy with this big torture device spreading the ribs from here to here. All this is muscle that's been cut, and sometimes we have to take out a rib to do it. And obviously that hurts, and it's not something you want to do and find out you didn't need it done because it wasn't a cancer. VATS, we have three small incisions in the chest. We go in with a video camera and then long instruments that have been designed for this. And eventually, we get a piece of lung that has a little nodule in it that we put in a bag and remove through one of these small incisions. And this is sort of what the operating room looks like. This would be me and an assistant, maybe a resident helping, and a nurse on a camera, anesthesia doctor here. And we're looking at the TV screen. It's kind of like a video game that your kids would play. And we're looking at a TV screen while we're doing surgery down here with these lung instruments. And this, boy, really, this is a little lung nodule. And so through one of those little incisions, I can put my finger and feel the nodule to identify it. And then we basically take a stapler that's designed for this and take out a little wedge of the lung that contains that nodule. So if we do that and we prove that it's a cancer, then the question is, what do you have to do to treat the cancer? What's the best operation for a, for a lung cancer? And that's kind of an evolution, sort of the way breast cancer was 15 years ago, where you used to take out the whole breast and sometimes even the muscle for a, for a breast cancer. Um, still, the basic operation for a, for a small lung cancer is a lobectomy. So on the left side, there are two lobes, and you take out the whole lobe. And here's the little cancer up here. But it's starting to, to shift. We're kind of getting smaller and smaller in terms of what we do. Um, I should say lobectomy is the operation and evaluating the lymph nodes, either removing all the lymph nodes, which are based in the middle of the chest, which is the first place a cancer would spread to, or um, at least sampling the lymph nodes and finding out if there's cancer in them. So here's what a lobectomy looks like. I'll just go very briefly. So you have blood vessels 
veins and arteries going into your lung. Here's your right lung. And basically what you do is you isolate out the veins and arteries going to the upper part, and you cut those, divide them, and you save the ones going to the lower part to do a lobectomy. And so then we cut the tissue between the upper lobe and the lower lobe. And then here's another artery being cut. And then we flip the lung the other way, and this is the bronchus that takes the air into your lung. And this is the part going to the lower lobe, and here's the part going to the upper lobe. And we cut that, and eventually everything's been divided that goes to that lobe, and we take it out. And like I said, that used to require a thoracotomy, a big incision. But now even a lobectomy can be done by video-assisted thoracic surgery. Um, so again, working through very small incisions, you're now looking at the picture that the surgeon actually sees on a TV camera through the video, and we're working with these long instruments. And this is dividing some of the tissue that gets us up to the vein, to the lower lobe. This is a lower lobectomy, and then we use a stapler to divide the vein. And then we go between the lobes and look for the arterial branches. These are all the arterial branches going to the lower lobe and going to the upper lobe. And then we use that stapler to divide those arterial branches. So it's all done kind of remotely. And then this is the last thing is the airway going into the lobe. And then we take out the lymph nodes. And we put the big, big lobe in a bag and pull it out. And there, there's like the fishing picture where you have the surgeon with the, with the lobe. So. Um, here at Stanford, we do about 50% of our lobectomies are done thoracoscopically. Nationwide, it's about 20%. It's growing rapidly as people gain more experience with it. Um, we wouldn't even consider this, obviously, if the cure rate weren't the same as the cure rate with doing it by a thoracotomy. Um, and it's been well proven now by multiple studies, including some I've been involved in, that for stage one, that is, if it has not spread to the lymph nodes, it's exactly the same as if you have a thoracotomy. And what are the benefits of having it done that way? Well, obviously, it hurts less, and that's been proven. People get back to their normal life much quicker. They take much less pain medication. That's no question about that. But probably even more important, obviously, that's important, but more important is you know, not how quickly you get back to work, but are your complication rates lower? And clearly, lots of studies have shown the complication rates are about 20% lower if you do it by video than do it by thoracotomy. And especially in elderly patients or patients with reduced pulmonary function, there's a huge difference in, in their complication rate. Um, also, if you get your operation by lobectomy and you end up needing chemotherapy afterwards, people who have thoracotomies tend to not get as much chemotherapy as Heather Wakeley would actually prescribe for them because it's, they're just a little sick for a couple of months and it's hard to get the chemotherapy in. And if they had a video, they're much better sooner, and so they tend to get all of their planned chemotherapy quicker, which is important. Um, so the only problem with vasculobectomy is that the lymph node dissection, I think, is not quite as good as what we can do open, the taking out all of the lymph nodes. So as long as you can be really sure it's stage one and it's not in the lymph nodes, it's a great operation. But if not, it's probably not the right operation. So I still do more advanced stages with an open incision. Um, I think maybe I'll skip this. Um, the other thing about it is that your surgeon better be really good at it because there are occasional uh, disasters for, from people who are inexperienced doing it. And you can imagine if you get into a big blood vessel and you only have small incisions. So you want to ask your surgeon how many of these have you done. That no surgeon is insulted by that unless you don't want them to be your surgeon. So um, you should ask your surgeon. And um, but in, in good hands, it's a great operation. And then very quickly, I'm going to go through recent interest in sublobar resection. That is, let's say you have a one and a half centimeter tumor that turned up on screening. Do you really need to have your whole right upper lobe taken out? Because that's, you know, 20% of your lung function, and you'll be a little short of breath after having that out, probably. So, you know, the theory of doing a lobectomy, taking out the whole lobe, is you clean out all the lymph nodes better, this operation, and you get a big wide margin on that tumor, right? So any place those cells might be trying to spread, you've got it. But it turns out that if you do a segmentectomy for small tumors, that's kind of taking out about half of the lobe. That's also very close to a lobectomy, if not exactly the same. A wedge resection, just taking out a little wedge of the, tu of the, the tumor and a little lung around it is probably not very good except for very specific types of small tumors. Um, so for these, what, these tumors that we often see, small tumors that we often see in non-smokers, especially Asian women, very often are amenable to a sublobar resection. It's very clear that they have a very high cure rate, in some studies 
whether they get a wedge resection or a lobectomy, or no matter what they get, as long as it get the tumor is taken out. But when you get a more solid tumor, the kinds of tumors that people who have smoked get, it's really not clear yet. Um, solid tumors less than up to three centimeters in size still have 18% of them have lymph node metastases, even tumors that are that small. And if you have it in your lymph nodes, you really need to have a lobectomy and all the lymph nodes removed. It looks, though, that size is very important. If you get down to less than two centimeters, this number falls to maybe five to eight percent, maybe even lower. If you get to less than a centimeter and a half, it's probably five percent. So for a very small tumor, it seems more and more um, that you can do less than a lobectomy and probably a segmentectomy, which is taking out about half the lobe and actually dividing specific vessels to specific parts, removing the lymph nodes from the middle of that lobe is the way to go. A wedge resection is probably not the best thing. Um, this study looked at wedge resections versus segmentectomies, so the two smaller versions of an operation on the lung. And the regional recurrence rate was 55% with a wedge resection versus 16% with a segment. And the survival was 71% with a segmentectomy and 48% with a wedge. So a wedge is probably not as good. A wedge is a lot easier for a surgeon to do, so there's a temptation for a surgeon to do a wedge because it's very safe and easy. Um, there are big studies going on nationally to try to prove this now, whether this is actually the case, that if you have a less than two centimeter tumor, you can have less than your whole lobe taken out. And there are other ideas like maybe adding a little a mesh with radiation therapy embedded in it onto the staple line where you, where you cut the lung, that that might help make a wedge resection adequate. But uh, that remains to be seen. So I will do, for less than two centimeter tumors, a segmentectomy. I'm very careful to sample the lymph nodes during the procedure and have the pathologist look at them right away. And if there's cancer in the lymph nodes, then you get a lobectomy. If there's not cancer in the lymph nodes, then you still try to do a segment and then you check your margin. It, you, you know, the pathologist look at where you stapled across. And if the margins are okay, you're done with a segmentectomy. But if they're not, you get a lobectomy. So that way you get the least operation you can get that's safe and really will cure you. Um, so in summary. Screening is fantastic because it's finding tumors we would have never known about and saving people's lives. But you also find lots of small nodules that aren't cancers. And so the decision about how to proceed is complex and you need people who are really thinking hard about whether this is really likely to be a cancer or not. Um, they shouldn't all be removed, that's for certain. But at least if we can do it by video camera, it hurts much less and we can generally remove them safely and without too much discomfort. And then now we can do VATS lobectomies, and even we're starting to do VATS sublobar resections. So um, you have a good chance of being cured without losing a lot of your lung function. And that's all, that's all I'll say about surgery for now. And I'd be glad to take a couple of questions. Yes? Um, unfortunately, cancers tend to metastasize. How do we know even at stage one that it hasn't gone to another organ? Yeah. So once we've made a diagnosis of lung cancer, or even if we're suspicious that something's a lung cancer, before you go to surgery or some other therapy, you are going to get what we call a metastatic workup. And that's going to include a PET scan, at least a PET scan and an MRI of the brain. And that will tell you with a very high probability whether you do or don't have metastasis. So if you have no metastasis, then you're going to be recommended to have a local therapy like surgery or radiation therapy. If you have had metastasis, if you have just one site, you might still be offered aggressive treatment, including surgery and radiation to one spread in the brain. If you have more than one, generally, you're going to get chemotherapy, and the chances of being cured are very, very low, unfortunately. That's the goal, is find these things before they metastasize. Are there, are there, are there, once you get lung cancer, are there organs that are more prevalent to be cancerous, like in, my, in the yeah. case of my husband, was the brain? So the most common places for lung cancer to spread are the brain, the bones, the, the adrenal glands, and the liver. So those are the places you most frequently see lung cancer spread to. Yes? Um, for biopsies, um, I've heard of another procedure, I think, where they use electromagnetic navigation. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about that? So there are things that have been added 
to bronchoscopy to make it more precise. And basically, it's a way of overlaying your CT scan image um, to create a target that the person doing the bronchoscopy can kind of steer to. And then even though he can't see the nodule, he can kind of know where it is by this overlay of the image and then put needles in it. And it will allow us to get, um, to get a, a diagnosis occasionally in a patient who there's, where there's no other way to make the diagnosis. But generally, if it's big enough to even consider doing surgery for it or worrying about it very much, it's big enough to either remove by video or remove by a needle biopsy through the chest wall. So I haven't been really excited about that technology, but there are some patients that it helps. Um, we haven't bought it. It's a very expensive device, um, and we've talked about it a lot, and we've decided not to buy one of those at Stanford. Um, but it's something that helps an occasional patient. Yes? Are there any uh, surrogate diagnostic markers on the horizon? Are you going to talk about that, Heather? Diagnostic things? There, there are a lot of things that are on the horizon. There's nothing that's yet prime time, but there are very interesting things being done. Obviously, there are a bunch of blood, there are blood tests. There's a lot of work on circulating tumor cells. We're doing work at Stanford on circulating tumor cells to see if you can, you know, find those. Um, sorry? Breath, I was going to mention. So um, amazingly, dogs somehow uh, have some sort of amazing uh, sense that they can differentiate between you train a dog to like bark when somebody lung cancer and not they, they so now then there's the, this device that's been developed called the electronic nose which can basically measure certain certain things in your exhaled breath that can differentiate pretty well whether you have a lung cancer or not that's all that testing has been done in big cancers though and what we need is something that will tell whether these small nodules are cancer and that's harder you guys have anything else to say about that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, what we are looking into is a genetic markers. That means the gene, cancer genes. And we can identify them. We have been trying to identify them in patients' yeah, breath. Louder? Yeah, come up to the mic. So at Stanford, the breath study, what we're doing is in patients who are diagnosed with lung cancer, we are trying to identify a gene-based marker you know, uh, specific tumor genes have been identified, so we have a screening tool where we can do microarray analysis on a breath and we identify specific tumor genes which can be identified in the lung when in patients with cancer. And then can be, can be detected um, by breath. We also found the differences in patients who have disseminated disease like metastasis and uh, advanced cancer versus early cancer. There's a difference in those markers. So these, this, these all things are still in investigative phase, and we are looking into more and more patients to validate our data. But these are gene-based markers. So you know we have a future for if we, if we can identify a specific gene, then we can identify the, or develop a therapy against it, too. Let's, uh, we'll hold any other questions for the end. Uh, so Bill Liu is in our uh, Department of Radiation Oncology and is a real expert in lung stereotactic radiation, um, which also can come into play sometimes with these novels. Thanks very much. So I'm going to be talking about some of the exciting developments in radiation therapy for early stage lung cancer. Uh, just as an overview, radiation therapy can have a role in the treatment of lung cancer at all stages, but tonight we're going to focus uh, primarily on detection and treatment of early stage lung cancer, and so I'll be talking about some of the new developments in radiation therapy in that arena. Okay. I'm going to recap briefly uh, some of the uh, emerging trends in lung cancer that are important, and there's some bad news there as well as good news, uh, and some of that was already covered by Dr. Upadai. Then I'll talk about uh, the new modality of stereotactic ablative radiotherapy, or SABER. What is it? Does it work? How is it done? Uh, and then uh, some concluding comments. So uh, in terms of lung cancer trends, uh, there are, as I said, some bad news and some good news. Okay? Uh, th this is uh, actually some good news. And uh, what we're seeing here is the incidence of lung cancer in the United States over time in men and women. And what we can see is that uh, in some recent years, uh, the trend has decreased in men and may have uh, recently peaked in women. 
And this is uh, starting in the 1990s, was about where that uh, peak was for men, and about 10 years later in women. Why these timings? Because uh, it was around the 1960s where smoking cessation efforts started be, uh, to happen in this country. And there's about a 30-year lag between smoking and lung cancer. And so the peak of smoking was back in the 60s uh, for men. Uh, and as you heard earlier, uh, the trend was later, about 10 years later for women, uh, before uh, the, the smoking cessation trend took on in women. Okay, so this is some good news. Uh, this trend does not hold up for the rest of the world, though, because in the rest of the world, smoking is still on the rise or not yet peaked. Uh, and so we're going to be seeing smoking increasing worldwide for a long time to come. The bad news, though, is that there's a demographic trend, and this is occurring worldwide. And I'll refer to this as the age shift. And if you look at, uh, so the earlier plot that I showed you was for age-adjusted cancer incidence. In other words, that's correcting for the age of the population. But if you look at total numbers projected over the next 20 years, all cancers are going to continue to rise. And if we look at lung cancer specifically, uh, it's going to increase about 50% in the next 20 years. And why is that? It's because the population is getting older, and so the people at risk of developing lung cancer are becoming more numerous. Um, and so that's an important trend. So just from this demographic trend of aging, lung cancer deaths worldwide are projected to increase by about 70% or more over the next 20 years. And also that means that patients who are diagnosed will be older and have more uh, other health problems. The other important trend, and this is going to be the good news, is that, that there's also a stage shift going on. So besides the age shift, there's a stage shift. So if you look at the survival in lung cancer, by stage, this is early stage, this is spread to lymph nodes, and this is spread to other parts of the body. At early stages, overall, survival uh, is pretty good. It's in about 50% uh, or more, uh, whereas... If you look at all patients with lung cancer put together, it's actually down in around 16%, pretty terrible. And the reason is because at the time of diagnosis, most patients, more than half, are diagnosed with advanced widespread lung cancer. And that's the trend that we're hoping will change. And this is the major headline that came out last year, as you heard earlier, uh, of a reduction in lung cancer mortality with early detection by low-dose CT. And the main findings, again, to recap, are that uh, with low-dose CT, lung cancer is picked up at earlier stage, and that actually translates into, this is a number of lung cancer deaths with low-dose CT compared to just plain chest x-rays. The number of deaths from lung cancer were reduced by 20%, uh, and in fact, that led to a 7% decrease in deaths from any cause in those patients who received the low-dose CT. So... The bad news uh, in terms of lung cancer trends is that because of past smoking trends and the aging of the population, this age shift, lung cancer will continue to increase in the United States and worldwide for the foreseeable future. The good news is, though, early detection strategies will identify lung cancer at earlier, more curable stages, and that's the stage shift. What this means is that we need more treatment strategies for early stage lung cancer, particularly in these older patients uh, that, it's, that are going to be diagnosed more frequently now uh, with lung cancer. So let's move on to stereotactic ablative radiotherapy. So now that we have uh, the ability to detect lung cancers earlier, what can we offer these patients? As you just heard from Dr. Schrager, surgery is the standard of care, and it can provide cures for 70% or more of these patients, particularly those who are candidates for the standard lobectomy operation. Unfortunately, and this is a bit of that bad news, at least 20% of patients have a hard time going through surgery because of age or age-related health problems. Uh, and out in the community, over a third of patients with early stage lung cancer don't have surgery for various reasons. In the past, the standard alternative to surgery has been conventional radiation therapy, but the results historically have been quite unsatisfactory. It's better than no treatment, uh, but definitely unsatisfactory. So that's the bad news. The good news is that we have new treatment options. So this tells us that there are three key groups of patients with early stage lung cancer. Those who are standard surgical candidates, those who could potentially have surgery, but they're at high risk. 
they may have poor lung function or heart disease. They may only be able to tolerate a partial lobectomy rather than the standard lobectomy. And then there are those patients who are outright what we call medically inoperable. They're too ill to have surgery, uh, and yet they have a uh, deadly lung cancer. So what is SABR? SABR is highly focused radiation using many radiation beams, all focused on uh, a small tumor. One of the key features is that it allows us to give high dose intensity. All of the radiation treatment is concentrated in a small number of treatments rather than spread out over many weeks as with conventional radiation therapy. And this requires that the treatment be highly accurate and precise. And we'll go through some illustrations of that in just a bit. Uh, there are a number of names for this. It's called stereotactic body radiation therapy, or SBRT, or radiosurgery. I will refer to it uh, in this talk as SABR. So what makes SABR different from conventional radiation therapy? These are the dose distributions. So there's a small tumor in the lung here, in the right lung. Uh, this is the same patient. If we were to treat this patient with conventional radiation, one radiation beam from the front and one from the back, you can see these lines representing the radiation dose cover a large area. So it includes the tumor, but it also includes a lot of the normal body. Whereas when you use many different radiation beams all focused on the tumor, you can see that these radiation dose lines are all concentrated on the tumor. So what that allows us to do is concentrate the radiation on small tumors and give a much more intensive dose in a smaller number of treatments uh, with less damage to the surrounding organs. And that also makes the treatment faster and more convenient. So does this actually work? Uh, I won't be able to review all of the clinical trials that have been done, but uh, one of the most important trials that came out of the United States uh, was this, uh, center, this, uh, this trial that was run across many centers in the U.S., finding that with SABR, small lung tumors in patients who were too ill to have standard surgery uh, resulted in tumor control rates of 98% uh, at three years. Uh, that's just the tumor itself. Of course, uh, uh, in the overall survival of these patients at three years was 56%, which is actually extremely good for patients who are too ill to have surgery. Uh, and so uh, some of them did develop tumor recurrences in other parts of the body. Uh, the majority of them actually died from causes other than cancer. Uh, does this hold up elsewhere? This is a population-based study in the Netherlands showing three time periods. Uh, from the late 1990s to uh, 2007. And in these three time periods, what they found was that uh, in the most recent time period, this is all patients with lung early stage lung cancer who were over age 75. In the most recent period, the survival over time uh, in these patients was improved compared to the previous eras. And why was that? Well, those patients who had surgery did about the same, actually slightly improved in the most recent era, indicating improvements in surgical outcomes. Uh, those patients who had no treatment at all did poorly and did about the same as in past eras. Uh, but those patients who had radiation therapy had a clear jump in survival in the most recent era, corresponding to when SABR was introduced in the Netherlands. In the United States, uh, this is a very recent publication that just came out uh, looking at the SEER and Medicare data. So these are patients uh, over age 65 who were treated for early stage lung cancer with either surgical lobectomy, sublobar or partial lobectomy, uh, uh, SABR, conventional radiation, or no treatment. And you can see that those who had the standard lobectomy did the best. Those who had partial lobectomy did uh, slightly worse. Those who had SABR uh, slight, and, or any radiation therapy did worse than that, and the worst was uh, no treatment at all. However, uh, these patients, why did they do worse in these groups? Uh, partly because those patients who could only have partial lobectomies were more ill than those who could have lobectomies. Those who had radiation were more ill than those could have surgery. Uh, but if you looked at these patients and matched them up based on risk factors, you could see that SABR compared with lobectomy was slightly lower in terms of outcomes. Uh, but it was not a statistically significant difference. It actually looked almost exactly the same as the sublobar resection, clearly better than conventional radiation therapy and much better than no treatment at all. So uh, in terms of whether SABR works, the, the preliminary data that we have currently is that SABR is superior to conventional radiation therapy for early stage lung cancer. 
and therefore it represents a new standard for those patients who are unable to have surgery. Uh, SABR appears to produce outcomes similar to surgery for the high-risk patients, and it may be a good alternative for older patients. These are all uh, results that need to be confirmed in clinical trials, and these are trials that we're doing currently at Stanford as well as worldwide. How is SABR done? Uh, well, some of the key steps are seeing the target and hitting the target, okay? Uh, and by that, uh, by seeing the target, what I'm referring to is that we plan the treatments very carefully. There's an initial planning session. This is where we position the patients in a reliable way uh, that we can treat in a, accurately time after time. And then uh, we do careful imaging, including PET scans and what we call 4D CT, which I'll show you an example of. When we've mapped out exactly where the tumor is, how it moves, um, and, uh, and what needs to be treated, then the goal is to hit the target. And at the time the radiation is delivered, we need to understand the motion of these tumors. These are tumors in lungs which move as you breathe, so we're trying to hit moving targets. Uh, we need to do imaging at the time of treatment to ensure that we're hitting exactly the right spot, uh, and then we need to manage that motion. So this is uh, an example of the type of scans that we do at the time of treatment planning. Uh, this is a PET CT scanner. It also has some additional devices attached to it. You can see that on the patient's belly, there's this little block with reflectors on it and a camera that monitors the position of that block so that while the scan is being acquired, uh, that camera is making a trace of the patient's breathing going up and down as the patient breathes and we can match when the scans are taken to what portion of the breathing cycle uh, it is happening in. Uh, one of the important uh, things that I'll point out here is at the time we do the treatment planning, at least at Stanford, our process is to update the PET-CT. Uh, and that's because when the patient is diagnosed initially, and this is an example of what looks like an early stage lung tumor, uh, by the time the patient comes for the actual treatment, which may be several weeks later by the time the patient sees me, the tumor can grow. Lung cancers are aggressive cancers. And you can see here that at the time we did the planning, the tumor was bigger than it was initially. But what we would not have appreciated unless we do a PET scan is the fact that at the initial diagnosis, uh, there was no evidence of lymph node spread, but by the time several weeks have passed. In this particular case, we see that a lymph node is involved, and that would not be picked up by the standard CT-based treatment planning techniques. And so having the most up-to-date information is very important to determining the proper treatment strategy. Do you work the radiation loose in the lymph So uh, it depends on the, uh, the exactly what we find. If this is, uh, the, this spread to the lymph nodes indicates a more advanced stage of cancer that uh, depending on the circumstances, we might include the combination of chemotherapy and radiation. Um, so uh, so this, the strategy will depend on the specific situation. Okay. So I mentioned those, the 4D scans, and what that is is a, a CT scan that's basically a movie. It's a CT movie, and you can see in this case, this is a patient who had previous surgery, so there's no left lung here. Uh, and there's a tumor in the remaining right lung that was newly diagnosed. And you can see as the patient breathes, it's moving quite a bit, okay? Um, <coughs> in this case, uh, well over an inch uh, in, of mo motion. Uh, by doing, so this is what 4D CT uh, information gives us. In addition, uh, we can do what we call 4D PET, uh, which overlays that activity of the PET scan. And you can see that there's a portion of uh, the, this, what looks like tumor at the bottom there by CT that's not actually active on the PET scan. It's just a bit of collapsed lung. So it helps us to distinguish exactly what is the tumor and how is it moving. Then we need to decide how are we going to address this moving tumor. Well, one way to do it uh, is to design, and this is a schematic showing uh, the area that's going to be given the radiation. Um, we make it big enough, that's one approach, is to make it big enough to, uh, to enclose all of the motion of the tumor. That way we are sure that we don't miss and we can customize this patient by patient. Uh, but uh, more sophisticated approaches would include uh, using a smaller treatment area and turning on the beam only at a certain portion of the breathing cycle. We call this respiratory gating. 
And you can see that by doing this, uh, we can make the, uh, the, the area of the lung that we have to treat with radiation substantially smaller in certain cases. Another approach would be to uh, follow the tumor with the radiation beam. We call this tumor tracking. Uh, so all of these are technologies that currently exist. Okay. Uh, in some patients, it's helpful to implant small metallic markers as uh, uh, radiation imaging uh, you know, uh, markers. And uh, this is an illustration of how a needle is inserted in through the lung and a small marker is placed right where the tumor is. Uh, and uh, this is something that could potentially be done at the time of a biopsy, for example. Uh, what we found is that with the current techniques that we use, we don't always need to do this. In fact, we're doing this less and less, uh, but this is one of the procedures that we might recommend doing for patients going through this procedure. Okay. Uh, these are a couple of examples of treatment technologies that we have. Uh, this is uh, the, uh, the base uh, technology is what we call a linear accelerator, and in this case, this is a, a cyber knife device where the linear accelerator is mounted on the arm of a robot, uh, and this allows us to do the tumor tracking sort of treatment where you can see that the robot is moving the radiation beam to follow the tumor as the patient breathes. Okay. Uh, another technology that we're using is... Um, uh, what we call arc therapy. Uh, this is a very true beam device that we have in our center. Uh, and you can see that uh, some of the important uh, features it has are uh, imaging devices that are mounted right on the uh, linear accelerator that allow us to make images of the patient uh, right before the treatment. Um, and this is an example of a treat type of treatment plan that we have. This, uh, we outline the area of the tumor on the CT scan, and then we plan an arc treatment where the radiation beam is coming from all around. Um, and this is, a, this is an example of how the tumor looks to the uh, radiation machine as it's going around. Uh, you can see that uh, it's, uh, let me just start this here. You can see that the radiation machine is rotating around the patient and there's a computer controlled shaping device uh, that uh, carefully maps out how the dose is delivered so that uh, this is the high dose region. It conforms very nicely to that target that we're trying to treat. Uh, then lower doses look like this. They bend around the spinal cord, in, in this example, around areas that we don't want to treat. So we have that kind of control. Uh, at the time of the treatment, uh, this is the, th that same scan showing where the tumor is. We can take a CT scan right on the time of the treatment, and this is an example of that. This is what we call an onboard CT, showing that the tumor is matched up exactly where we want it to be. Uh, and then we start the treatment, and this is uh, an example of that uh, rotational treatment. And you can see that as the machine rotates around, it's pausing. It's pausing to do that respiratory gating. Uh, but, uh, the, the, there's a camera monitoring this block that's sitting on the abdomen of the patient and turning on the beam at exactly the right time. Some of the results that we can see look like this. This is uh, treatment with uh, the cyber knife device. You can see this is the tumor before treatment. After treatment, all that's left are those little metallic markers that we implanted uh, over two years later. Uh, this is a treatment on using that arc therapy that I just showed you. At the beginning of treatment, there's this uh, a very active tumor on the PET scan. Two months after SABR, all that activity is gone. Then a year later, what we see is some inflammation reaction in the normal lung tissue, and this is something that commonly happens. Uh, but by more than two years later, what's left is some scar tissue uh, and uh, no evidence of the cancer. So just a few concluding comments. Uh, lung cancer uh, is, a is a growing global epidemic. Early detection promises to decrease deaths by allowing treatment at earlier stages where the tumors are more curable. Many patients with stage one lung cancer cannot or do not have surgery for a number of reasons. Uh, and uh, particularly as patients are getting older at, when, at the time of diagnosis, we need some strategies to help those patients. SABR is a promising treatment option for those patients with poor health or older age. Uh, and hopefully, uh, as I've shown you, this is complex treatment, so expertise is critical. It's not just about the technology, it's also about uh, the expertise and experience. 
And the most important way that we learn about how to do this, how to improve our treatments for patients, is to do clinical trials. So there are numerous trials going on at Stanford and worldwide. Um, this is the radiation oncology uh, lung cancer team. Uh, myself and Dr. Dean are the physician leads. And patients who come to see us are actually cared for uh, from the time they step into the door by a huge team of people that work behind the scenes. So at least a dozen or more people working behind the scenes for every patient that we treat. So just to illustrate that this really is Star Wars technology, lung tumor stereotactic uh, ablative radiotherapy or lightsaber. Thank you. Uh, no, well, so the, the, the uh, original invention of this technique was uh, in Sweden uh, at the Karolinska Institute. Uh, it rapidly spread uh, throughout Europe and then Japan. Actually, in the United States, Stanford was one of the first centers doing this, as well as Indiana University. Uh, and then in recent years, in terms of doing the clinical trials, the United States has rapidly caught up uh, and, and in some ways surpassed uh, what the rest of the world is doing. So. So uh, this, this is actually a, a covered treatment by Medicare for early stage lung cancer in patients who are unable to have surgery. So, uh, so it is a covered expense and it's standard. Um, uh, in terms of the costs, it turns out that because of the shortening of the course of radiation, it's actually, uh, it can be less expensive than a conventional many week course of radiation therapy. Uh, and it may be similar in cost to, uh, to surgery, actually. Do you have any data for late-stage treatment with these devices? Right. Well, so I have focused uh, specifically on early-stage lung cancer. Radiation therapy, of course, has a role in more advanced lung cancer. Uh, in those situations, we would also use very precise radiation therapy, but we would be treating larger areas, often that include lymph nodes and so on. And so when you're treating a lot more of the normal organs, you can't get away with giving a huge blast of radiation in a short period of time. So those are the treatments that are spread out a little bit more over time, although uh, more and more we're able to accelerate those somewhat, and we combine that with chemotherapy generally. And then for the very advanced stage where it's spread beyond the lungs, chemotherapy would be the main treatment for those, uh, but in certain patients who have very limited, uh, you know, sites of spread outside of the lungs, you know, we may be able to use focused radiation or surgery or other ways to address those specific spots. Brain metastasis is the classic yeah. site that's treated with, with this technology. And what do the data set tell us in terms of changing outcomes for that set? Well, there are some data that uh, indicate that uh, these more modern radiation therapy techniques do give better results than the historical results with conventional radiation therapy. What we don't have for many of these treatment techniques uh, is head-to-head -head comparisons uh, in terms of randomized trials. Those are important to do, and there are trials now ongoing, including at Stanford, of, uh, for example, comparison of SABER with surgery for high-risk uh, patients um, uh, who can only have partial lobe removal. How is the cyber knife related to SABRE? Uh, is it a subset of SABRE? Yes, it is. So the question was, how is CyberKnife related to SABRE? CyberKnife is one of the technologies or machines that can be used to give SABRE. Um, I showed you an example of uh, a few of them, and there are multiple ones that can be used to deliver uh, this type of treatment. We have several of these platforms here at Stanford and kind of can choose the right technology for the right situation. It's essentially a brand name. Yeah. Um, you know, like Coke is a cola, CyberKnife is a form of saber. Yeah. So the question is whether cancer threatens the lung function, uh, and that depends on how extensive it is. Often with these very early stage lung cancers, they're not really affecting the lung function. Um, and, uh, and that's one of the problems is, uh, in terms of diagnosis. That's why it doesn't cause symptoms. Uh, but uh, uh, so it's not the cancer itself that's causing the lung function problems. It's the underlying lung disease from smoking and other uh, problems like that. So the question is, besides cancer, what else cuts down on the efficiency of the lung? Uh, you wanted to yeah. answer? Okay. 
Well, I can answer that better because I'm a pulmonologist. So there are several reasons which can decrease lung capacity or lung function. First of all, if the patients are smoker, then smoking-induced lung damage, that can be emphysema or COPD. There are other chronic lung diseases like lung fibrosis or you know, some of the uh, infectious diseases, such as very commonly we see something called as coccidiomycosis or valley fever towards uh, California belt. These are the infections can cause localized lesions in the, in, the, uh, in the lung, and they appear like tumor, but they are infections and can be treated with antibiotics. Other things like infections, post-infection fibrosis can occur. How, you know, you get scar on the skin and other surfaces. Similarly, lungs do not heal always uh, very well. You know, it can cause a post-infective scarring that also can cause collapse of the lung or a part of the lung can get fibros. So these, th these things certainly can reduce lung capacity either acutely or over a period of time. Okay. So our last speaker is Heather Wakeley, who's the head of our um, thoracic medical oncology group, and Heather is going to talk about targeted therapies. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So um, nice to see you all and see lots of familiar faces. Um, so we've been focusing most of this so far on um, diagnosis, treatment of early stage disease. As a medical oncologist, I do play a role in many patients with early stage disease, but also treat a lot of patients with more advanced or metastatic disease. And so what I'm going to talk about now are some of the newer treatments that we have that start in patients with metastatic disease, and as we find things that are promising, we're able to bring them into earlier stages of disease and hopefully um, find more of a role for curing patients in that setting, though of course we'd like to cure everybody. So I'll talk about this. So first I'm just going to talk a little bit about where we started. And Chemotherapy is still a very important part of what we do to treat lung cancer patients. Um, in the past, though, as recently as a decade ago, we didn't really have a good way to pick what was the right chemotherapy for what patient. So this graph is, is results from a trial where many patients went on and all of them received chemotherapy. There were four different types of chemotherapy. And what this is showing is that all of those worked about the same. So it didn't really matter which drug. All the drugs that we had in the past were very similar in how they worked. And fortunately, we've been able to move beyond that. And that's by doing this targeted. So all of the standard chemotherapy, all of those IV drugs, um, those are targeting something that has to do with DNA replication. In order to make a new cell, you have to make new DNA. We understand a lot about how that's done, and so we've been able to develop a lot of drugs that do something to, to destroy that system and lead to the cells dying. But we don't really have a good way of knowing which cancer so are going to react the best to which drug, so it's been sort of a moving ahead blindly in the past. However, more recently, we have a much better understanding of the biology behind cancers. And in lung cancer in particular, there are these a few types of pathways that we know are very, very important, especially in some cancers, some lung cancers. And therefore, we've got drugs that we can use that work very well for some people and should be avoided for others. So a couple of these pathways, this is the vascular endothelial growth factor. This is the epidermal growth factor, or EGFR. And then there's some newer ones, ALK, MET, uh, there's one called ROS. And I'm just going to talk you through those a little bit as we go through this. So the first is the antiangiogenesis or the blood vessel. And here you see this is a, you know, the first cell in the body that develops changes, that turns it from a normal cell into a cancer, then starts to divide. And those first few little cells, well, that's not a big deal. The body can come in and take care of those. But as it starts to divide further and grow, it has to pull in blood vessels. And as it does that, it then sort of takes on a life of its own and becomes a threatening cancer. And that process here of going from a little ball of cells to a, an actual tumor that's threatening involves this angiogenesis, or new blood vessel growth. And there's a, a protein here called VEGF, um, which is very, very important for that. And so scientists realized this and developed drugs to go after VEGF. And when it was first discovered and trials were done in mice, studies in mice, it looked like maybe this was going to be the key and we were going to be able to cure cancer. Unfortunately, that was not quite where we are, but there have been some very exciting drugs developed to, to target this. 
So to give you a picture, this is a little cartoon going back to your biology days. Uh, this is the surface of a cell. And on the surface of the cell are proteins, and they do many, many things. These little cartoons are receptors. So these are sitting here on the cell waiting for something to come and bind and turn them on. And when they're turned on, they, down in this end, these are tyrosine kinases. So what they're doing is they're taking a phosphate, they're putting it on a protein, and that's one of the ways the cells can signal, to, signal within and kind of change what's being done. So this diagram shows, say this is the VEGF receptor. The epidermal growth factor EGFR receptor looks exactly the same in a cartoon like this. And it's sitting here. When the ligand, or whatever it's supposed to, to bind comes, turns this on, and then it starts doing what it's supposed to do. So to block that, we have a couple different strategies. One would be to, if you block, suck up all of this ligand that's floating around, then there's nothing that's going to tell that protein to start signaling, right? So that's what something like bevacizumab or Avastin does. It's an antibody that goes out into the blood, and any time it finds a VEGF molecule, it sucks it up so that it can't circulate. And therefore, when people are getting this drug, there's no VEGF in their body, and that's going to lower the amount of new blood vessel formation, this angiogenesis process. Another approach is to turn off the business end. So if you said, OK, here's your ligand you're supposed to turn on, and then you have an off switch, then it doesn't matter how much of this is floating around, it's turned off. And this is what a lot of the EGFR drugs do, like erlotinib, also called Tarceva. And then there are others that do different things. They, they sort of can block where the ligand's supposed to bind. There are various different approaches that we've developed, new ways of, of going after these types of, of proteins that are so important in cancer. So focusing on the VEGF one, there's a trial with this drug bevacizumab or Avastin for patients with advanced lung cancer. And everybody on the trial got standard chemotherapy, and half the people got this Avastin or bevacizumab drug. And at the end of the day, um, the people who got the bevacizumab drug did a little bit better. So this is a survival curve, um, and this is how we, we think about comparing drugs to each other. Now, obviously, for an individual person, this doesn't mean a whole lot, but as we're trying to figure out is a drug better or not better overall in a group, this is how we have to think about things. So this darker line are the patients who got the bevacizumab, and this is showing that more of them were able to live longer that's why this, this is kind of on top of this dotted line. Um, and in fact, if you look at it, these are all patients with metastatic lung cancer. When they got the combination with the bevacizumab, a quarter of them were still alive at two years. Now, we'd like to have everybody alive at two years and five years and 10 years, but this was a substantial improvement um, from what we had had before with just the chemotherapy. So this is the reason that this drug is sometimes something we use in metastatic lung cancer. Unfortunately, even though it's a targeted drug and we know what we're targeting, we don't really know how to pick which patients are going to have the most benefit and who isn't. And so that's a big problem. And there have been a lot of people working trying to figure out what should we be looking at to figure out who should get this drug and who hasn't. But we haven't made a lot of progress yet. It's been a very frustrating problem. Um, we know not to give it to patients who have the squamous type of lung cancer because that can increase the risk for bleeding. But that's about the only signal that we have. Um, so this is a drug that we can use sometimes. We know what it's targeting, and it can help a little bit. We're also looking to bring this into patients with early stage disease after surgery. But we don't know yet if it works or not. So this is an ongoing trial where patients who have had surgery, and obviously there are a lot of other reasons why someone would be um, able to go on the study or not. We obviously want it to be safe, and so for some patients it wouldn't be safe. But for those where it's safe, if they choose to go on the trial, they then get chemotherapy after surgery, or they get the addition of this drug. And so we're trying to see if this drug that seems to help a lot of patients with metastatic disease can also help people after surgery. And so that's an example of how we take what we know from metastatic disease and bring it into earlier stage treatment. So this is a little bit more complicated picture of what I showed you before. This is a cell surface. And those are those same cartoons, remember, of those receptors. These are these proteins sitting on the surface of the cell waiting to get the ligand to bind to, say, turn on. In this case, it's the epidermal growth factor, or EGFR. And I know a lot of you have heard this term before if you've done any reading about lung cancer. And so in this setting, um, most of the drugs developed in this pathway are focused here. So if the ligand turns on the protein down here, um, it then leads to changes in a lot of other proteins in the cell 
which then change what the cell itself is doing and lead it to, to grow, um, to develop new blood vessels, to spread to other places. So a lot of things you don't want a cancer cell to do. Um, it turns out that in some lung cancer patients, the reason they have lung cancer is that there was a mutation, a change in this particular protein, this EGFR. And when that happens, instead of waiting to say, okay, turn on, turn off, it gets turned on all the time. And if you can imagine, if you've got a protein that's leading to, to growth, um, to new blood vessels, to kind of living forever, you don't want that turned on all the time, right? That's really what's driving the cancer in a lot of patients with lung cancer. Um, and so a lot of these newer drugs are working to turn off the signal when it's turned on the wrong way. And some of these drugs are gefitinib, erisa, and erlotinib, which is also called Tarceva. And again, we're back to our original picture here um, with those same proteins and kind of turning them off here with those two drugs. And there's a newer one called a fatinib, which will probably be available in the next, um, I don't know, maybe next year, hopefully. So this is another... Um, same kind of picture I showed you before. This is from another trial where at the beginning, we didn't know all of that, I just told you. We just knew that EGFR was important in lung cancer and therefore people developed drugs that targeted it. And this was the trial initially done where a lot of patients got the drug, some got placebo, some got the drug, and it showed that on average the people who got the, the drug did a little bit better. It wasn't curing people, but there were some folks out here living two, three years, um, and more of them than when they were just getting a placebo pill. But what was interesting was it wasn't everybody responding the same. Women seemed to respond more. So 14% of women who got the drug, their cancers really shrunk quite a bit. And those with this adenocarcinoma type of lung cancer were more likely to have their cancer shrink. And especially people who had never smoked who had lung cancer, their cancer seemed to really shrink. So this caught people wondering, is there something different about the EGFR protein in those patients than in everybody else? And it also led to a big trial where patients who kind of fit that criteria, they'd never smoked, they hadn't been treated in Asia, um, they got either um, just a fitnib drug, which is one of the, a pill targeting the EGFR, or they got chemo. And so it was a comparison head to head. And the original results were kind of confusing because remember those curves are supposed to stay separated? These cross, so that didn't make a lot of sense. And the survival didn't seem to matter. And so people were left saying, well, we don't know if this is better or not better. We're not sure what it means. But while the trial was happening, there was a big breakthrough. And people actually figured out that science I was showing you before. They figured out that some patients, that EGFR protein was turned on all the time, that there was a mutation that had done that. And they figured out that it was those patients that had that mutation that were the ones who really, really responded to the drug. So this is, again, that picture I was showing you. And this is sort of, this is the part that gets turned on all the time. So you have to have a drug that blocks that. And when that's done, you get these dramatic responses. So you've seen a couple CT scans. Um, this is basically a slice through a person's chest right here. So this is the heart. These are the lungs. This is what a lung's supposed to look like. This is not what it's supposed to look like. So that's a tumor. Um, and the same thing here. This is up a little bit higher. But that's, that's not what it's supposed to look like. However, after treatment, you got back to having normal looking lung. Um, and so these are the kind of responses you can understand where someone would be having some trouble breathing if their CT scan looked like this and they're breathing normally and feeling quite good. Unfortunately, we don't cure people this way, but it's dramatic improvement and it you know, helps people quite a bit for a long time. And so as people started looking at these mutations more, they realized that the mutations in these tumors occurred more often in Asia than in the United States, so about 10% in people in the United States. It was more often in the adenocarcinoma type, more often in people who had never smoked. So about a third of patients who get lung cancer who have never smoked have this particular mutation in their tumor, and also a little bit more common in women than in men. And so when they looked back to that trial that compared this drug versus chemo and looked for patients who had the mutations, they found that if you had the mutation in your tumor, the drug targeting that protein was much better than getting chemo. And this is actually, this isn't just survival, this is living without the cancer growing. So that's why these come down. Um, but if you didn't have that mutation, even though you were probably a woman and you'd never smoked and you were in Asia, it was still better to get chemo because it was really about that mutation. It wasn't about the, the person. It was about the tumor and the mutation in the tumor. So this was really a big breakthrough in our understanding of how to treat lung cancer and a lot of other cancers. And really, the reason I'm spending a lot of time on this is to emphasize that now we're looking for not just this mutation, but other mutations, and really changing the whole way we treat lung cancer. 
Unfortunately, as I mentioned, this doesn't last forever. Patients who have these great responses, on average in about a year, but there's a huge range. I still have some patients who've been on these drugs for like six, seven years. Um, but on average, it doesn't work forever. Something happens. The tumors are clever. They figure out how to become resistant, how to not have that drug work anymore. And when that happens, the cancers start to grow. And then we have to come up with a new plan. And so some of the promising new plans is this combination. This is that newer drug, Afatinib, which also goes after EGFR, and an antibody drug called Cetuximab. This is a different kind of plot, so I'm going to walk you through this. What this is, this is sort of neutral. These patients, their tumor grew when they got this combination. And these are all patients who had an EGFR mutation in their tumor, had gotten erlotinib, tumor shrunk, and then it started to grow again. So they developed resistance. Um, and in this setting, these patients, unfortunately, their tumor grew, but that means everybody else's tumor shrunk. So this is really exciting. So for patients, their tumors had shrunk initially, then grown. Now we have this combination that seems to work really, really well. Still being tested, not available yet, but something you know, holds promise. And we're doing a lot of research at Stanford and many other universities, not just on this combination, but many other new drugs, new combinations, trying to overcome that resistance. OK. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about other targets. So this is um, if you take all patients with non-small cell lung cancer, the adenocarcinoma type, and you kind of put them into different groups. This is that grouping that has the EGFR. So in this, it was 17%, but somewhere between 10 and 20%. There's a lot of folks that have this, what's called KRAS, and we're developing new drugs that target that specific mutation. There's a group about 10% that has this EML4 ELK I'm going to mention next. And then smaller pieces with these other mutations where we can say, aha, that's why this person has cancer. Something happened in this gene in a cell at some point in the past, and that gave that cell the ability to grow and grow and become a cancer. And if we can go after that, hopefully we can knock out the cancer. Unfortunately, again, we haven't figured out how to cure that way yet, but we can make a lot of progress. So this is another one of those what we call waterfall plots. This is with that patients who have that ELK. I just mentioned ELK is another one of these mutations. And this is a newer drug called crizotinib. And in this, it's the same idea. For patients whose tumor is really being driven by this ELK, if they get the crizotinib drug, their tumor is much, much more likely to shrink than to grow. So patients have dramatic responses, that same idea. These, we have CT scans that look that same, you know, lots of disease cleared up. And again, unfortunately, it's not forever, um, but it's a, it's a significant progress. And the patients who have this tend also to be patients who have, don't have a smoking history. Um, more often, well, equal men and women. So these are just some of the demographics. And I don't want people to leave here thinking, oh, well, it's only patients who've never smoked where we figured this out. That's not the case. It's just that a lot of times, tumors in patients who have never smoked are simpler. There have only been like one or two changes. And so we're able to figure those out first. And now we're turning our attention to all patients with lung cancer, really trying to sort out this puzzle of what is it, what is the molecular underpinning of the disease. So this is a new one, ROS. This is something that was uh, just presented at the beginning of, of this year, 2012. And this, these are all the things I'm talking about, things we actually test for now at Stanford. Um, and so we've identified a number of patients who have this. These patients also respond very well to that crizotinib drug. And in squamous cell tumors, again, this was um, data just presented this year, looking at these genes as reasons for squamous cell tumors. So in summary, we now have these three targeted drugs that are approved for the treatment of advanced lung cancer. This eml 4 ALK fusion is one of the newer ones, and crizotinib works well for that in the ROS1. We can find these mutations now in over half of patients with lung cancer, both adeno and squamous. And that allows us to treat differently. And I should mention, too, just as I mentioned with the bevacizumab, we're taking that now into patients after surgery. We're starting to look for these mutations in patients who have had surgery and doing the trials to figure out if these sorts of drugs should be used after surgery and not just in metastatic disease. We don't know the answers to that yet, but we're doing that work. Um, and at Stanford, we're now routinely looking for over 20 mutations um, in, in the ALK and the ROS. And there are a lot of other treatments and development in clinical trials. So I'm going to end with this. This is that pie again, patients with uh, non-small cell lung cancer. And we still don't know for a lot of people why they have this. But for the others, we're starting to figure out. And with these genes, we have drugs either approved or in development to treat. So that's really we, the future of, of treatment of lung cancer. And with that, I'll stop. And I know we've, we've run a little over, but we'll stay and, and certainly allow people to ask questions. So. Direct questions 
to any of the speakers, and we'd all be glad to answer. I'd like to make an announcement, if I may. The Lung Cancer Support Group is going to have a vigil on December 1st in, on Lytton Square between 2 and 4. Great. Okay. Did you all hear that? So there's going to be a, um, a vigil um, on December 1st in support of um, lung cancer patients. Who, it, awareness. My daughter has ordered these bracelets oh, great. for people, and I have a huge placard with Thank you. Okay, so that's going to be um, in Lytton Plaza on the 1st from 2 to 4. Yes. Hi. I'm the Wiki. Um, you just mentioned that uh, some people take uh, a silver and it's good for a year, and the other might be good for six or seven years. What could be the factors for all those you know, difference? Trying to figure that out. But don't know yet. <laughs> Do we know anything right now? Um, we don't. I mean, the, the first understanding comes from figuring out for the patients where it doesn't work for that long what happened. Um, and we've made some progress in understanding what are the other mutations that develop that change the ability of the Tarsiva to work. Um, so that's kind of where we've made some progress. Trying to figure out what stops that from happening in other folks, we we haven't gotten to that piece of the puzzle yet, but there are a lot of people trying to work on that. Is there any research on that right now? Yes. Mm -hmm. If I understood correctly, there is research going on on why some cells get not targeted. So is there then going to be more research? How come those resisted better mm -hmm. because of their co composition? Right, so again, many, many, many people are trying to figure out um, and the work I'm showing is obviously work done by hundreds of people at hundreds of institutions trying to understand what is it that makes a cancer cell a cancer cell. What has changed? What pathways are involved? What's driving that? Why is it different? Why do those cells not die the way normal cells die? Um, and it's a very, very complex question. And so we've been able to figure it out for some cancers, for some people. Um, and then also trying to figure out why does, why does it stop working? Why have what we figured out then changes over time? Um, but it, there isn't one answer, right? There, there been a lot of work being done. I saw a couple of, yes, in the back. Do you have any information on uh, anti-PD-1? Um, sure. So the PD-1 or a PD-L1, it's uh, actually immune-based therapies. Um, and I didn't really talk about that today but because uh, I only had 15 minutes. Um, but immune-based therapies is also a very important component of, of anti-cancer therapy. Um, so the PD-1, PD-L1, that's sort of a uh, a signal that tumor cells develop that basically says, don't attack me, I'm okay. Um, and there are now treatments that can block that signal so that the immune system is better able to recognize those cancer cells. So um, certain cancers are more likely to express that. Um, and so what's being done right now is research to better identify which of the cancer cells are expressing the PDL and therefore are going to be more sensitive to treatments that block it. Um, and so that's, we're, we're doing some of that work and there are a lot of other groups doing that work. And then there are many, many drugs now in development, um, one of which was presented at our annual meeting with a lot of um, excitement uh, and, pr and published this year. Um, but there's several others being developed also. So I think we're gonna see a lot more about that class of drugs in the near future. And we do have ongoing trials at Stanford looking at that pathway. There are a lot of other immune strategies also in development. I heard the stage four Well, there, though it's not the, the usual, we certainly have some patients who had very good responses to therapy or had very limited disease that we were able to treat with um, my colleagues, uh, you know, no one that we've cured with chemotherapy alone, but there are some patients who have great responses and get radiation and surgery where they don't have any active cancer anymore, so we can't, you know, and they're still living. Um, again, we wish there was many, many more people than it is, but there's a handful. Patients who are requiring ongoing active therapy, I have a, I, I mean, I have to kind of think back. I didn't look back through the numbers, but there are um, a, a number of patients who have lived three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, you know, there are people living longer, um, but it's not everybody. And so as I meet with patients who are newly diagnosed, we always try to, you know, you have to have a hope 
um, because you don't know. Um, you have to be prepared because we still are in a situation where most people who have metastatic lung cancer don't live for years. They live for less time than that. And so you have to be prepared, but then you have to be hopeful. And especially as we're learning more and more, then new drugs are coming out all the time. I think we're hopefully going to be able to say, you know, the majority of my patients are living more than five years. I just can't say that yet. The 2% in five-plus-year survival rate is really it, it is. Um, and so, again, you've got to keep in mind that that is taking all comers at all, all phases. And many patients um, are unfortunately diagnosed when they're already quite sick from other illnesses and aren't able to get treatment. If you look at the patients who are on active treatment and able to get treatment, the numbers are better than that. And again, those are historical numbers. They're not taking into account all of this. Sure. The, the question was whether for patients with advanced lung cancer, can you do radiation therapy alone? Well, so that, uh, that would generally not be the treatment of choice. It's not the most effective treatment. But for certain patients, it may be appropriate. Patients who uh, may not be able to tolerate chemotherapy uh, and have a limited amount, a limited enough amount of cancer that it could all be targeted with radiation. So uh, every patient has to be evaluated to see what the appropriate treatment is for that patient. Um, so there are certain situations where we might do that, but that would be kind of a special case. Uh, the question is, how much do the family history plays a role significantly? It does. And we do take it into account, and you know, if there are any additional factors, we add them up. Uh, it is, of course, uh, very cautiously, um, it must be looked into what are the risk factors, what is the age, what are the other diseases in the lung, and all those factors add, to add them to our, together. So, so far, is, uh, of course, uh, should, we, should the patient get screened with the family history? Now, so far, the data we have to tell you whether we can identify these cancers at early stage, data does not show that there is, there any, there is any benefit. However, we as a pulmonologist, we take individual patient and individual family as a particular case. Say there are associated other factors which can suggest that the patient is at high risk. Or if we find some lesions which cannot be explained otherwise, then we do sort of follow them up very meticulously, or if necessary, we do, we do the biopsies of those lesions too, uh, knowing that we may be wrong, that th those things may not be cancer. So we are keeping a high, uh, sort of high grade watch on those lesions and meticulously monitoring them. Um, of course, it's a double AJ sword. How much do we, uh, you know, how many patients do we send for follow up CAT scans or or follow-up surgery or follow-up procedures. They can be, you know, it's a balance between overdoing it or underdoing it. So we have to select out each and every case individually. I okay. just wanted to add mm -hmm. a little bit there, too. Um, with, with lung cancer and the family history, we don't have the same understanding yet that we do for, like, colon cancer or breast cancer to be able to say if you have, you know, this relative and that relative, what's the chance that you might and what's the screening that you should do? Those things haven't been worked out yet. Um, and the, the linkage of family history and lung cancer isn't as strong as for some of the other cancers. So um, there are a lot of variables, as uh, Dr. Pade was saying, um, and so that's something that I think over time we're going to learn more about. It's not routinely recommended, though, for those reasons at this time because we just don't know. One more in the back. Yeah. Well, actually, I'm interested about the anti pd one It's one question, and then I just want to separate three part, and then you can answer one question. Okay. The question one was after the ballot, and uh, the Stanford has a trial for most stage patient. And uh, what is the, uh, the responses right now? And then it's still on the trial, and will be FDA, FDA will approve in a couple of years. That's my question. Okay. So again, so the PD-1 data so far has been fairly limited. There's only been one very large trial, and it was still, you know, not a randomized study. And so it's very difficult for us to know what does something really mean outside of a larger trial. So we're a ways away um, from it being approved. However, the stage three, uh, the phase three trial that's going to lead to approval is going to be starting sometime in 2013, and likely will accrue fairly quickly. And so we'll probably have answers to that in another 
couple of years. Um, the trials that we're doing at Stanford with PD-1 and PDL one are all still phase one, meaning that they're very, very early. There are very few numbers of patients we're looking to see are these other drugs, do, are they tolerable, you know, are there hints of response. Um, and so those all tend to be studies for patients who have metastatic cancer, people who have already been through several types of treatment before. Um, and so you know, it's, it's still very, very early. It's very exciting. Um, but there's a lot of work that still needs to be done to understand those drugs. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.